Hello, I'm pleased to introduce another lecture presented by the geologists of Jackson Hole in the Teton County Library. I'm Elizabeth Kingwell, board member of the geologists of Jackson Hole. It's my pleasure to introduce Michael Adler, who will be talking about water in our solar system and where it came from. Mike is also a board member and a frequent presenter in our lecture series, giving upwards of 20 talks so far. Mike graduated from MIT in 1971 as a PhD in the area of solid state physics and worked at General Electric from 1971 until his retirement in 2000. At GE, he was the manager of a group of 150 people who did research in the areas of power electronics, control systems, and semiconductor assembly. He is widely published in the area of semiconductor physics with over 100 papers, and based on this is a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, the world's largest professional society. Mike has been active in the IEEE for 30 years and was the IEEE president in 2003 and was on the IEEE board of directors from 1996 to 2004. Mike has been pursuing his hobbies of astronomy and photography in retirement, as well as traveling with his wife, Virginia, on two trips of a lifetime each year. He has been giving talks on a number of topics in astronomy, geology, climate change, and travel to groups in New York, the Royal Academy Society of Canada in Ontario, and the geologists of Jackson Hole in Jackson, Wyoming. He has been the lead in organizing three extended field trips for the geologists of Scotland, Iceland, and New Zealand. And now, Michael Adler. Thank you, Elizabeth, um, uh, for that very nice introduction. Um, I'm pleased to be able to uh, give this talk on uh, where water is in our solar system and how it got there. This is a uh, key question uh, for uh, astronomers and frankly for all of us because uh, water is, uh, uh, without water, life like we know it doesn't exist. And, and so where the water is, is a key, uh, is a key question uh, in uh, astronomy circles. Okay, so I'm going to now uh, uh, share my screen and we'll get into the talk. Okay, so um, here we are. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this picture. It's a picture of a, the Saturn moon Enceladus, which is one of the uh, um, uh, poster children for water in, in the solar system. But I'm, first I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, how the solar system formed. And uh, this will be very brief, but I think it is helpful to begin the talk this way. The sun uh, began, the, our solar system began with the formation of the sun about 4.6 billion years ago. And the way that happens, uh, because uh, the sun was built, uh, was a third generation star, and it was uh, in a, there was a cloud of gas and dust uh, that existed partly from previous stars, which had come and gone. But so here's this uh, cloud of gas and dust, and some event, uh, maybe a, a supernova, started uh, the, uh, the, this gas and dust to contract. And once it, it starts to contract, gravity takes over and, and contracts it more and more. And if it in fact uh, heats up enough to 15 uh, million degrees Kelvin, then uh, what happens is uh, a, a nuclear reaction starts and the hydrogen gas uh, starts a, uh, a reaction that ch changes it into helium. And there's just a little bit of matter that's uh, different between the helium and that ends up in the hydrogen that started. And that difference, E equals mc squared per Einstein, is light and heat and uh, uh, the energy that the sun gives away. Okay, so in the process of doing this, the sun uh, consumed about 99% of the uh, matter in the cloud of gas and dust, but there was some leftover. And the leftover gas and dust uh, forms the solar system, the, uh, the planets and the moons and the asteroids and, and everything in the solar system. Now, we're pretty much, uh, we're going to talk about the solar system in kind of two uh, areas because closest to the sun, where what, where, what are called the terrestrial planets, everything from Mars, uh, uh, Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury, were formed from a hot, ga from a hot gas and the materials that form these planets 
were refractories. They were things that could exist at high temperature. But outside of the uh, asteroid belt, which is just uh, a little bit further away than uh, Mars is, uh, are, are the, uh, is the snow line. And beyond what's called the snow line, everything is frozen. So you have gas and dust in frozen, uh, well, some gas, but then a lot of ice, of various forms of ice, of, of water and other elements in this part. And the, these, the large gas giants formed as well as their moons. And all of these uh, were formed uh, from this, this frozen uh, material. So, um, and if you look at the water uh, in this uh, early solar system, it uh, during in the areas closest to the sun inside of this the um, inside of the snow line that was largely uh, ga that would be water vapor outside the snow line over on this side uh, we what we have is frozen water and frozen other gases as I mentioned uh, earlier um, there's a lot of water in the solar system uh, and in fact uh, the number is uh, quite huge it's one one comma five or 1.5 followed by uh, 11 zeros uh, cubic kilometers. And this is actually 10,000 times the amount of water on earth. So it's a lot of water. And what's surprising to probably you at this point is that most of it exists outside of uh, the earth, even though we have a, what we think is a lot of water. Overall though, it's not surprising that there's a lot of water in the solar system because hydrogen is the most dominant element. 90% of all the, uh, atoms in the uh, universe are hydrogen. And uh, what it takes uh, to make water is hydrogen is a very reactive element. And as long as there's uh, oxygen around, hydrogen gets oxidized very quickly and forms water. So, uh, so the question, the key question that we have now is uh, where, is the, where is the water uh, at, at this moment and how did it get there? So we're gonna take, uh, start the talk with probably the most, um, uh, uh, what you might think is the most unlikely place, which is Pluto, uh, but uh, surprisingly there's water there. And then we're going to uh, work ourselves through the solar system, and then we'll end the talk with how it got there. Um, now, most of that, it, most of the question there is not so much how it got to the outer areas beyond the snow line, because frankly, they were formed from uh, frozen water and frozen uh, and gas, hydrogen and helium gas. But what the bigger question is how did the water get on the terrestrial planets that were formed at extremely high temperatures where uh, the, uh, any water that existed was in vapor form and uh, may or may not have uh, uh, been accumulated in the planets as they were forming because the temperature is so hot. So that's gonna be how, we're, that'll be the end of the talk. So uh, I'm gonna just essentially jump ahead to the answer, not the answer to that question, but partly the answer of where the water is now so you can see this, and we'll come back to this graph, but this is a graph I, I accumulated uh, all the data uh, uh, from various sources as to uh, where the water is, and then uh, developed this graph, which is this, the ratio of the water uh, on various, uh, uh, various moons in, uh, in the solar system uh, to Earth. So here we have um, Ganymede, which is a moon of Jupiter, and Titan, which is a moon of, uh, of uh, Saturn, and, and the smaller moons, and here's Earth, so number one. So this is the reference. This is the amount of water on Earth, which uh, is like 1.4 uh, times 10 to the ninth cubic kilometers. But um, for now, we'll just call it units. So you can see most of the water exists on, uh, on, these, uh, on these moons of these large uh, planets, and even Pluto, now we'll, we'll get to that. And then if you look on the inner solar system, there really isn't much water at all except a little bit on Mars. And we'll be talking about that shortly. This also shows you uh, that Earth stands out from this group. Notice that the, these are, this, is, this graph is a density in, in grams per cubic centimeter uh, for each of these objects in the solar system. And you can see they're all around two and uh, maybe a little bit more, but Earth stands out to being uh, 2.5.6, yet it has a substantial amount of water on it. So question is why? Why these planets are not surprising in these moons because they're formed a, a lot of 25, on the average, 25 to 30% of all of these are water. Uh, then we have the rest of the terrestrial planets, which have, uh, um, which have a very high density, but as you can see from the previous graph, virtually no water. Okay, so we're now gonna jump to Pluto. 
And I'll just uh, quickly remind you, um, I gave a talk on Pluto um, a few years ago. Uh, this is just one of the beautiful uh, images that the New Horizons satellite took of when it was approaching Pluto on July 14th, 2015. And this just shows some of the uh, um, uh, haze layers that exist over the planet. And then all of you, I'm sure, remember uh, these pictures. Uh, these are uh, beautiful photographs of uh, the planet uh, and this very amazing heart-shaped uh, heart of uh, Pluto. It's called the Tombo Regio. Uh, and this is uh, showing it in, in a little more detail. And this is a very smooth surface area that looks like it had uh, um, uh, it has been worked over um, uh, fairly recently because there's no uh, active uh, craters that you can see where there are craters elsewhere. Okay, so um, one of the key questions that uh, people, uh, in the, uh, astronomers who are doing the uh, New Horizons mission asked, could life existed on, or lift light exist, or could it have existed on Pluto? Seems like a very long stretch. But anyways, uh, scientists typically look at three criteria when looking at light. Is there energy? Are there organic molecules? And is there liquid water? Liquid water again. And uh, so to answer these questions quickly, radioactive decay is uh, Pluto's dominant energy source and might actually be keeping some of the uh, inner part of the planet uh, 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 close to the melting point. Um, in addition, uh, these elements, you can see methane, nitrogen, uh, carbon monoxide, and water was measured by the New Horizons. So, so there, are, there are organic uh, elements on Pluto as well. So two of the uh, criteria have been met. So that leaves water. And so question is, could there be liquid water on the planet? Well, one, one indication that there might be is the fact that there are large cracks like this one uh, on the surface that New Horizons uh, uh, imaged in this picture. And one way for a crack like that to develop is that uh, you have a ocean underneath that is uh, partially refreezing or frozen and uh, expands and causes uh, these cracks. Um, there are other evidences of uh, the presence of water on Pluto in addition. This is uh, something called the Wright Mons, which is a, what's called a cryovolcano which is a volcano that's been created by water, um, uh, water oozing up through the surface uh, from below. And so, um, and, and then continuing on with evidence that, of water is Pluto, uh, like most planets, uh, mo while most planets have an equatorial bulge where the equator is, is fatter than it is uh, 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 elsewhere, that's not the case on Pluto. Now, one way to remove a bulge is to have a subsurface ocean, uh, a liquid ocean that uh, it, uh, might uh, be uh, large enough that the surface ice shell just can't uh, uh, be supported by it and it collapses and so goes the uh, equatorial bulge. Another issue is that uh, is the um, Tambio Recchio or the Sputnik, the Sputnik Plantia. That happens to lie exactly opposite um, uh, the, the moon Charon, uh, uh, Pluto's largest moon. And they're tidally locked together uh, and they always face each other. Now, so what, what could cause that? Most likely a increased mass underneath the Tombo Regio and, uh, and what could cause an increased mass? A buried ocean. So there are four lines of evidence that suggest that there might be a subsurface ocean. Uh, none of them are conclusive by themselves, but when you add them all up, the odds seem to favor the existence of, a, uh, of such an ocean, a liquid ocean. Now, the obvious question is, how could a liquid ocean exist on Pluto with an incredibly cold uh, where it is uh, so far away from the sun? It took the satellite, uh, the New Horizons uh, spacecraft, 10 years to get there, and it's, it's, it's a long way. It's very cold. Well. The answer is, if there wasn't, if if, if there if nothing was uh, done, it would um, there was something uh, uh, the the ocean would have been frozen, um, and this is just data showing what uh, over time the radius of the planet uh, and the uh, time, and uh, this is from the beginning to uh, essentially now, and it certainly would have frozen. This this graph shows heat the uh, uh, 
flow of heat from the center. But uh, a paper was written uh, in Nature Geoscience uh, about a year ago, and it proposed that if there was a, a layer of, um, of a, a gas insulating gas hydrate, clathate hydrate, if that if a layer, such a layer like this existed, it could actually have prevented these uh, the core of the uh, uh, planet from totally freezing up. And now this is uh, there's no evidence for the existence of this, but this is a plausible uh, this the formation of such a layer is plausible, and it would have actually done the job. So uh, in summary, as far as Pluto goes. It's quite likely that there is a liquid ocean. Um, uh, evidence suggests there is. There is a, a mechanism that would actually preserve it uh, from freezing uh, in, in the time since uh, the planet was, uh, or the moon, uh, Pluto was first formed. Pluto itself has a rather low density of about 1.9 grams per cubic centimeter. Remember I said Earth was 5.6, so it's a lot lower than Earth. Water is one gram per cubic center, so you, you can just imagine that there probably is a fair amount of water. Well, in fact, the estimate is 30% of Pluto is water. Um, and, uh, and when you add it all together, um, it turns out that this turns out to be about one and a half times the amount of water as on Earth, uh, which is so okay, so it's pretty amazing. You know, you say, well, Pluto is so small, but the point is the fraction of water on Earth is very tiny whereas on, on Pluto is 30% of the whole planet. And so that's the reason. Um, in addition, if you spread this out uniformly over the surface, and it's called, uh, it would be 1.7 kilometers in depth. That's called the global equivalent layer, GEL. And we'll actually be coming up with a number of that for every object that we've, uh, we, we will talk about in this talk. So now we're going to move on to the um, uh, the other question, uh, um, the other sort of poster. Well, the real poster child that where the search for water has been going on uh, fairly intensively. With uh, uh, I think there's been like 40 missions overall to Mars, and uh, the the ro the U.S. rovers like Curiosity main mission is to look for evidence of water on the planet. So um, here's uh, uh, we're going to go through this. Um, uh, uh, looking, I'm going to show you the results of search for water on, on Mars. The first uh, um, uh, piece of data here has to do with the South Pole. And uh, there's the, in 2004, the uh, European Space Agency's uh, Mars Express Orbiter investigated the South Polar Cap and found a, a great deal of almost pure water right on the surface. Uh, they also found, uh, which was surprising, Way beyond the surface, uh, tens of kilometers away, um, uh, scarps of uh, permafrost that contain significant amounts of water. So when the, all of this data, when the data from this was analyzed, um, NASA estimated that there was a, a global equivalent layer from just this water alone. If this water was spread uniformly uh, across the planet, it would have been 11 meters in depth. And it probably is more meaningful than me telling you that amounts to 1.6 million cubic kilometers. Okay, now turning to the North Pole, uh, this, uh, there's some data here that was uh, accumulated by the U.S. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, using shallow radar uh, device. And these are the radar, radar ec uh, echoes going down to uh, two kilometers below the surface and showing a, a two kilometer thick layer of ice on the northern uh, pole. So again, when this was analyzed, um, this contributes another 1.7 million cubic kilometers of ice, adding to the global equivalent layer of, of 12 more meters of, of water if spread across the surface. And just as an uh, an, uh, just as uh, anecdote, um, this, there's about 2.9 million cubic kilometers of uh, ice on the Greenland ice cap. So this is a fair amount of ice. And so together, you have from the south and the north poles, you come up with a, a global equivalent layer of 23 meters. Then uh, fairly recently, um, uh, use the same Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, also using its uh, radar, has discovered eight different locations in the uh, mid-latitudes where there is buried um, of ice. And, uh, and when all of this was added together, this added uh, Oh, and another 5 million 
uh, cubic uh, kilometers of ice, and uh, which bringing the total equivalent layer up to 35 meters. And that's kind of where uh, it, where we are right now. But there's one other piece of uh, important data relative to uh, Mars water, and that's the discovery of what we think now is a buried layer of water below the surface. Now this came by going back uh, to the data that was um, developed by the um, European Space Agency on their express uh, spacecraft. What they did was they went back and took the data and reanalyzed it using uh, high-speed computers on Earth. And they were able to isolate areas uh, from the original data um, that, uh, uh, that looked like water. And so this is actually the, um, uh, the radar image um, uh, going down, in this case, one and a half kilometers. And these bright blue areas are what we think is water. And the evidence for that is these are the reflections of, of, the, uh, of the radar. So the red is the reflection from the surface reflection. And this blue is the reflection down uh, one and a half kilometers. So you can see in this area, these line up. In this area where we there were water, they think water is the echo is uh, is actually stronger than the surface reflection. Okay, so um, oh yeah, and then let me uh, add to this that um, further evidence that this is actually liquid uh, is they analyzed the um, permittivity of the water. They were able to do that and or this area, and they found out that it had a very high permittivity. Of, of something on the order of over 20. And that's a, an indication of uh, probably a salty water area where similar permittivities exist on Earth for that type of uh, medium uh, salty water. So pretty clearly uh, evidence of a buried layer. They don't have an estimate of how much there is because they the, the expectation is that it probably exists elsewhere on, on Mars as well. Now, so it does look like there is a fair amount of water on Mars, and it does look like there might even be liquid water. Now we're going to go back in time. And uh, this graph um, is a little complicated, but um, on this axis is an estimate of the water present as a function of time. This is back to four, minute, four and a half million years ago up to the present. But let me focus on the red graph. The red plot is uh, the water deuterium hydrogen ratio. Now, what is deuterium? Deuterium is heavy water, where it's a hydrogen, um, it's a, a proton in the nucleus with a, a neutron. It essentially doubles the weight of the hydrogen atom. And uh, <clears throat> the, the study of the, uh, the, this ratio gives a strong indication of, of, of what goes on, what's happened in the uh, history in the, uh, of, of the uh, planet. And uh, there are so if you go back in time, there are some uh, data uh, asteroids and material that have been analyzed that have been dated all the way back to the very early time before at the time of this formation of the solar system that to have a ratio of close to one. Now, one in this case is the ratio of uh, deuterium to hydrogen on Earth. And so it says that Mars once had uh, deuterium to hydrogen ratio very similar to Earth. And, and then uh, dating several other pieces of uh, several other data points somewhat later, um, a, a higher uh, ratio of deuterium to water, then clay materials in Gale Crater that was analyzed by the Curiosity rover, and then the current data uh, in um, in atmospheric uh, in polar water and atmospheric uh, um, moisture uh, show a ratio of uh, seven to eight, and. Um, this by itself is so. This graph is it shows that deuterium, the ratio of hydrogen to deuterium, has changed over time. Why is that significant? Because the 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 lighter hydrogen is uh, has escaped. It's half the weight of the uh, of the deuterium. And when Mars lost its um, uh, magnetic field, uh, it, it was no longer shielded uh, from the sun, solar wind and the atmosphere started getting uh, uh, carried away to the point that most of the, uh, the atmosphere, the estimate is that Mars once did have a fairly dense atmosphere and most of it's carried away. And the evidence is that what's left is that mo you have mostly hydrogen uh, or the deuterium that's left. So this is an indication of, of the presence of a lot more water 
and water that has gotten lost over the uh, millennia. And when they uh, analyze this trend, they they come up with an estimate that Mars once had six and a half times the amount of water it probably has right now. And when you put that uh, uh, when you uh, uh, put that together, that probably means that Mars once had an early ocean that had 32 million cubic kilometers of water, which would be a global equivalent layer of 227 meters, a lot more than it is right now. And this uh, this water layer might actually occupy 19 percent of the uh, of the Martian surface, and that that's been analyzed by studying the topography. Now this compares to uh, the Atlantic Ocean, which occupies about 16% of uh, Earth's surface. So one quick question is where, what happened to the water? And th these are some uh, uh, artists' conceptions of, of, of over time from 4 billion years ago to essentially present, uh, showing that uh, where the water probably existed and uh, over time and gradually disappearing, now existing mostly on the poles, um, and some of these buried areas that I've, I've spoke about. Um, in addition, uh, well, and so, um, but so the question where, what happened to the water? Well, one is, is some of it still here? There are uh, 35 um, meters equivalent layers still there. Some of it may be locked up in, in, uh, in the basalt, but the bulk of it evaporated once, or, uh, once um, uh, um, Mars lost its atmosphere and it got swept away, it lost its magnetic field. Okay, so in summary, um, the, uh, about um, uh, Mars, the water summary, is, is that there's, um, well, it's been heavily studied because there, it's, it's Mars, uh, of all the planets, is the, other than Earth, seems like a planet that could have had life at one time, and possibly still it does, but uh, because it's the closest to uh, an environment that exists on Earth of all the all the current planets. Um, it currently has <clears throat> pretty clearly at least 35 millimeters of equivalent water level, and uh, which is about four tenths of a percent of the amount of water on Earth. Evidence also strongly suggests that Mars once had oceans, lakes, and deltas and streams. A uh, lot of data, particularly from the um, Curiosity rover, uh, that has uh, shown that. And in fact, we now think there may even be liquid water. Um, and when you study the shoreline, they think that uh, the water coverage um, could be quite significant, uh, maybe 75% of the surface of the planet covered with water as compared to 71% on Earth. And, um, and, and supporting the uh, evidence that there might have been uh, these lakes and, and oceans, there's pretty strong evidence also that Mars once had a dense atmosphere, which disappeared early on. Uh, when the magnetic field vanished, and that also uh, carried away the disappearance of the atmosphere, also was associated with disappearance of a lot of the water. Okay, so we have to talk about water on Earth too. So, um, uh, but I, I only have one view graph on this, and it's just uh, just quickly summarize it. Um, Ninety-six and a half percent of the water on Earth is in the oceans, salt water. Fresh water is two and a half percent. Then of that uh, two and a half percent uh, surface and other fresh water that's most accessible to us is only 1.2 percent of the two and a half percent, tiny uh, tiny amount. And uh, then you, know, you can see how it breaks down elsewhere in terms of living things, rivers and lakes, and uh, most of the water is locked up in ice. And um, so we where our access to it, while we think we have plenty of water. Well, we don't have plenty of water. Water is a, an important resource. And, 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 but the planet has a lot of water, but not all of it is easily accessible. Um, and as I, I mentioned this very early on, Earth uh, has uh, the highest density of any body in the solar system, 5.6 grams per cubic centimeter. And when you add us all of this water up, it comes out to 1.4 uh, billion cubic kilometers, which translates to a global equivalent layer of 3.7 kilometers. In other words, if all that water was uh, uh, was uh, located uniformly on the surface, it'd be 3.7 kilometers. And you can see that's a lot more than uh, uh, Mars because we are talking about uh, 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 35 meters, not kilometers. 
And but in spite of that, this is actually only one percent of the total water in the major uh, bodies of the solar system, and 0.01 percent if one included the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud. Um, <clears throat> Now we're gonna talk briefly about uh, the other terrestrial planets, Venus. Venus was is Earth's twin, or as close to it uh, as, come, as it comes, but it's changed a lot. And at one time, there was, uh, scientists are pretty sure that there may have been as much water on Venus as there is on Earth now. And, but something happened to it. And what, what happened to it is something called the runaway greenhouse effect. And uh, what, that, what, what this amounted to is that when uh, water evaporates from the surface, it gets into the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, when, you do, when the water density isn't that high, a good fraction of that water vapor uh, uh, dis is dissipated uh, into, the, uh, into uh, outer space. But if the water at, in the atmosphere gets uh, at too high a density and the atmosphere gets soaked, um, there's a limit to how much uh, heat can actually escape. And so what happens is the heat builds up and it, it increases the surface temperature, causing more water to evaporate, increasing the density of water in the atmosphere, which further uh, act, water is a great greenhouse gas, reflecting back most of the heat to the surface until all the water, what happens? It all evaporates. And over time, it all ends up uh, uh, um, the water itself dissipates into the atmosphere, so it just disappears. And uh, this very this process could happen on Earth eventually when the sun heats up, uh, as it's going to uh, uh, before uh, in the next uh, uh, several, maybe of 600 million years. So don't worry about it uh, uh, too soon. But uh, it's we think we're uh, having a greenhouse effect now. Well, there's there's something much heavier coming. Okay, so summary of water on Venus, almost all of it's gone. Um, evidence of that is that it has a much higher deuterium to hydrogen ratio, 100 times higher, more deuterium. So it indicates that, uh, that uh, what's, what's left, what, what little hydrogen is left uh, on the planet is largely uh, deuterium because the lighter hydrogen is, is uh, it dissipated, it's gone. Um, what also has happened is with the lack of plate tectonics, um, the CO2, which on Earth is buried, most of it is not in the atmosphere on Earth. It's in the crust and in the oceans. Well, on Venus, it's all in the atmosphere. And Venus has an incredible surface pressure of 1,350 pounds per square inch, 100 times, almost 100 times greater uh, than on Earth. So this, this would be not very pleasant. Uh, we'd be all be crushed. Um, and so overall, I uh, was able to find some references. The estimate is that um, Venus has about 100,000 times less water than Earth, or Earth has 100,000 times more. It's all in the atmosphere. So uh, Venus's uh, global equivalent layer is 34 millimeters, not meters, not kilometers, but millimeters. Okay, so in summary on the planets, um, other than Earth and Mars, there's very little water. Uh, Mars has... Uh, uh, a four tenths of a percent or 0.004 of the amount of water with a global equivalent of 35 millimeter uh, meters. Um, Venus has this uh, minuscule amount of water, which is uh, 30 millimeters. Mercury even less with a global equivalent of three millimeters and our moon is infinitesimal. It's almost microns of equivalent water on the moon. Okay, so now we're going to talk about where the water, uh, the bulk of the water is in the universe. So we're going to work our way outwards again and first talk about uh, the asteroids. Now, Ceres is the largest um, asteroid in the asteroid belt. Uh, it's uh, not huge. It's about, uh, it, it, Pluto is 2.6 times bigger than, uh, than Ceres is. Um, but it is the only object in the uh, in the asteroid belt that is actually circular by its own shape. The gravity is big enough that it formed a circular body. And it has one third of all the mass of the uh, asteroid belt. Uh, it has a density of 2.1 grams per cubic centimeter. So it, is a, a, it has a low density, much lower than Earth or Mars. Uh, it's estimated to have about 
of the uh, of, of the plant of the object of the sat of the asteroid is water, and that in ice, well, water in ice, uh, and this tr translates to about seven percent of the uh, water as uh, as exists on Earth, just seven percent. So the inner uh, layer is. Uh, uh, this was this analysis, by the way, was done as a result of the data that came from the Dawn satellite, which uh, investigated uh, both Ceres uh, and um, oh, now the name escapes me. The uh, another of the uh, uh, large, uh, uh, not nearly as large as Ceres, but another of the uh, asteroids. And anyway, they, um, uh, the the innermost layer is uh, largely hydrated rocks. And then the external layer, which is a crust of about 40 kilometers thick, is a mixture of uh, ice and salts and hydrated materials. And between might very well be a liquid layer. And so when you, so it's 7% of the water on Earth and has a global equivalent layer of 35 kilometers um, uh, compared to 2.7 kilometers. Now it's only 7% because it's this is a layer on the surface of this small asteroid. So it, it mounts to a lot of thickness on the small asteroid, whereas um, it's only 2.7 kilometers uh, on Earth. Okay, so now moving on to where, uh, where the bulk of the water is, and these are the moons of the gas giants. So all but a fraction of the water in the solar system is on the moons. And if you, um, in fact, that's about 95% uh, of the water is on these, uh, uh, um, is, well, all but a fraction is, is outside the, the, the snow line, but 95% of the water uh, on these moons uh, is, uh, it constitutes 95% of the water in the solar system main bodies. So the Europa, the first one I'm going to talk about, is really the poster child for the search for Earth on, in the solar system. Europa is the sixth largest moon in the solar system, just behind our moon. It's got, the surface is full of cracks, uh, and these are largely caused by what's called tidally heated, heating. Uh, Europa uh, um, orbits Jupiter, and Jupiter has a huge magnetic field. Europa is quite close, and the, uh, these cracks are occurring because of the fact that the insides of the planet or the moon is being uh, squeezed and expanded as it operate, as it rotates around the planet because the orbit is not perfectly circular. So it gets squeezed uh, more at one point around than the other, and this causes cracking. Um, however, when they <clears throat> oh, scientists looked at these larger cracks, they realized that these cracks were not couldn't be quite saw uh, couldn't quite line up with just uh, tidal heating. Something else was going on. Now, what else was going on was probably a layer of liquid or warmer ice existed below the surface. In addition, Europa has a magnetic field that is believed to be caused by an ocean of salty water underneath. In other words, the motion, the, as the planet rotates, uh, as the moon rotates around Jupiter, what this uh, salty uh, uh, water get, is, ca is caused to move. and uh, Creates a magnetic field. So moving, moving uh, ions uh, can will cause a field. But unlike Earth, this is this ocean is not on the surface. It's below a shell of ice, maybe 10 to 15 uh, miles thick. Uh, but then the ocean has a, a depth of uh, uh, of about 40 to 100 miles, which is actually quite deep. Um, and uh, in in fact. NASA has uh, announced in uh, 2013 that they've actually seen venting of water uh, into space by the Hubble telescope. And so this is a cartoon of what this uh, uh, layer might look like of water with uh, vents underneath uh, uh, he heating occurring uh, from uh, um, uh, volcanic effects uh, in the core, heating up the water causing cracking and then venting out to the uh, uh, outer layer. So uh, there, this, this, as I mentioned, is a poster child. So there are missions that are planned to Europa to study it and see if uh, there is any evidence of life. Uh, so uh, NASA is going to do this in, um, in the probably around 2025. European Space Agency is sending a mission to Ganymede, which will also study Europa. 
So uh, when you add it all up, Europa, the estimate is that Europa has about 25% water or water ice and 75% silicate rock. And it has a density of about three grams per cubic centimeter, which translates uh, to a amount of water 2.9 times the water as on Earth. And it has a global equivalent layer of 120 meters. So now we're going to talk about Ganymede. Now, uh, Ganymede is the largest uh, moon in the solar system, uh, another, of course, a moon of Jupiter. Uh, it was studied just like um, Europa was by the uh, Galileo um, and Boy well, Galileo and Voyager uh, satellites. Ganymede is the largest moon. It is 8% larger than, um, than the planet Mercury. So it's the ninth largest object in the solar system, even though it's a moon. But it's only 45% massive because its density, as I'll get to, is, is lower. It has a magnetic field, probably due to a core. And uh, it's uh, <clears throat> uh, Hubble has a, a data from the Hubble uh, telescope has been analyzed. And it's felt that there are, is a liquid ocean on Ganymede. And part of this uh, evidence comes from the fact that the aurora, since Ganymede has a magnetic field, uh, uh, it uh, it actually has an aurora, and uh, the aurora changes as the uh, as the moon orbits Jupiter, and uh, and because of the change, it estimates that this uh, that this liquid ocean is probably 60 miles thick, 10 times deeper than uh, Earth's ocean. So when uh, when the when it, the estimating is done, the analysis is done. <clears throat> it's felt that San, Ganymede is approximately 60% silicate rock and 40% water and water ice, um, which in fact an internal ocean that may contain more water than all of the uh, Earth's oceans combined. It has a low density of 1.9 <clears throat> and overall has uh, estimate is 27 times the amount of water on Earth with a global equivalent layer of 380 kilometers. At 27 times, this is the <clears throat> most water of any of the objects in the solar system. Now we're going to turn to um, uh, the moons of uh, Saturn. Uh, we'll talk about two of them. Um, en Enceladus is the uh, poster child for uh, 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 life possible on, uh, in, on the, in the Saturn system. Uh, this was uh, taken by the Cassini spacecraft. It's the sixth largest uh, moon of Saturn, but it's a tiny moon. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get into that. It's mostly covered by clean of water ice, so it's very reflective. So it has a very low temperature of minus 324 degrees Fahrenheit. So Cassini took this famous picture of actual water vapor uh, geysers um, uh, being erupted on the surface of the planet. And 100 of these have been identified, which emitting is 440 pounds per second of, uh, of water being uh, emitted through the surface of Enceladus. And so, there, and when the data was analyzed, uh, it's felt that there is a liquid uh, subsurface ocean with a, a thickness of six miles uh, on the planet. Um, and not only is it just water vapor, but they analyzed the contents of the water and they found that there was methane, water, uh, or uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and uh, complex organics uh, in, in the in the uh, water vapor. Uh, this is a picture of the North Pole and the South Pole of Enceladus. These uh, stripes here in the South Pole are called the tiger stripes. And this is where most of the, or all of the venting that's, that was shown in that picture is coming from. So this is a, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, a, a diagram uh, of what probably is going on in, in Enceladus. You have tidal heating from the motion uh, of uh, around the planet, causing heat to rise and uh, the causing water in this uh, buried layer to become heated and then increased in pressure and then venting through the surface, much like geysers exist on Earth. The estimate is that the, uh, the ocean depth is somewhere between 26 and 30 kilometers compared to Earth's uh, depth average depth of nine kilometers. So summarizing, um, Enceladus has a uh, 
density of about 1.6 cubic centimeters uh, it, grams per cubic centimeters. That is uh, uh, quite low. It's estimate of 60% of the planet or moon is water, and the rest is silicate and, and iron. Uh, it has a small radius of 248 kilometers compared to uh, six, over 6,000 on Earth. Based on this, it has uh, um, uh, about 3.9 uh, cubic kilometers uh, times 10 to the seventh um, cubic kilometers, or 38 million uh, cubic kilometers of water, which is about 0.027, uh, about 2.7 percent of the water on Earth. A global equivalent layer of 42 kilometers. So again, a thick layer on a small object. So Titan uh, is the largest uh, moon in uh, Saturn. It's the second largest moon in the solar system. Um, it's larger in diameter than uh, uh, Mercury even. It, uh, uh, it has an estimate of, uh, of several layers, one of which could be a buried water layer. Uh, cent the, the center of it is thought to be a hydrosilicate uh, silicate core. Um, it has a density of about 1.9 grams per cubic centimeter, um, and the overall composition is estimated to be half water ice and half rocky material. Um, the surface features are observed to move, and the Cassini, uh, Cassini looked at it very carefully over its uh, uh, long life of orbiting Saturn, and it, the surface features were uh, observed to systematically shift up to 19 miles, suggesting that the surface and the core were not connected, and there was a, a layer of, of uh, liquid water that was uh, separating the two. Uh, <clears throat> Titan's atmosphere uh, is similar to Earth's in the sense that it's about uh, it's a little higher in pressure, 1.5 bar, and it has a significant atmosphere, 50% higher than Earth's. Uh, it also contains mostly nitrogen, but unlike Earth's, it doesn't contain uh, much, if any, water vapor. It's mostly methane, uh, and uh, and the, it forms clouds of methane, like we get water clouds on Earth, and it'll rain methane rains, and uh, there are, as I'll show you, uh, actually oceans of methane on the surface. So the planet is the only uh, planet on the solar system other than Earth that actually has liquid uh, on the surface. Um, these are uh, pictures that were taken by Cassini of some of these oceans. They're all on the uh, northern in the northern polar area and uh, yeah these oceans are not water they're uh, either methane or uh, ethane uh, this one uh, was a, a, a deep more detailed picture of one of these I could have I could go back um, it's th this one right here and uh, it's a detailed picture amazing picture when you look at the detail and then th this is a detail of this little uh, peninsula sticking out. So overall, <clears throat> uh, yeah, this lake is uh, has an area of uh, about 126,000 square kilometers. It's actually larger than the combined uh, area of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Titan overall is 50% water, as I said earlier, and uh, so it has up to 25 times as much water on Earth in a global equivalent of 370. So in addition to Ganymede, this is the number two object in the solar system that has liquid water. Well, we don't normally talk about Triton's moons or Neptun's moons, but Triton also is a moon that has uh, that is quite large. It's the seventh largest moon. Um, it's 22% smaller than our, our own moon. Uh, it has an extremely cold surface temperature, about 38 degrees, and it has a orbit that's actually opposite in direction to the rotation of the planet. It's the only moon, large moon, that does that. Um, because of the uh, composition of the planet being largely, of um, the moon being large, a lot of it being ice, um, it, it, and it's, it's, uh, it's the fact uh, it has a strange orbit. It's thought to have been an uh, object that was in the Kupier belt that was captured, um, uh, uh, that was captured by the, the, the planet. There also have been plumes observed emitting from uh, from uh, Neptune by the Voyager uh, spacecraft, and this picture was taken by the Voyager spacecraft in 1989. This shows some of the topology on the surface in the image, but um, 
this planet has a almost perfectly, excuse me, this moon has almost perfectly a circular orbit, but, and it, it takes a non-circular orbit to have the tidal heating going on, but it has a tilt. And because of the tilt, different parts of the uh, moon are exposed at different points in the orbit and that causes internal heating. Uh, and so there very well could be a liquid ocean here as well. So overall, Triton has a density about uh, two grams per cubic centimeter, estimate of 25% water or water ice and has a uh, water content also more than Earth's about 1.9 times and a global equivalent layer of 104 kilometers. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna just a couple of uh, two charts on the copier and the Oort cloud. So here are, this is a, a diagram of the inner solar system showing Jupiter. And then if you put that in the context of um, the outer solar system, here we are. And then we have the orbits of Neptune and then the uh, orbit of Pluto, which is not circular. And then you have Sedna, which is a, a uh, another object in the Kupier belt. So the Kupier belt is, is extends beyond the uh, Neptune or uh, 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 Neptune orbit. And it's largely, uh, it, it extends from 30 AU to 50 AU. One AU is the 93 million miles of distance between the sun and the earth. Um, like the asteroid belt, it's mainly composed of remnants uh, from when the satellite, when the solar system was formed. It's, it's composed mainly of frozen volatiles. Estimate is that it contains somewhere between 4 and 10% of an Earth mass and is about 25% water ice. So if assuming it is right in between at 7%, it contains <clears throat> a, a one and 11 zeros of cubic uh, cubic uh, uh, kilometers of water, which turns out to be 70 times the amount of water in Earth. So there's a lot of water out here, but not concentrated in any object, single objects. Pluto uh, probably, and maybe Sedna, have, uh, have a significant fraction of that water. But it's so large that it, what it, it's, um, it, it, even at, at a very low density, it accumulates, there's a fair amount of water there. Then, then, then you get what, to what's called the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is a theoretical cloud of predominantly icy planetesimals, otherwise known as comets. So here is a, um, uh, a graph, a plot that uh, it, in um, um, uh, it's not a linear; it's uh, um, logarithmic. So you have um, uh, Neptune here, then you have. Uh, uh, the interstellar space uh, beginning and the Oort cloud extending all the way out to uh, 3.2 light years is the estimate or 200,000 uh, AUs uh, Earth orbits. So in a diagram, if you put that previous diagram, so here we have the Kupier belt, and then you stick the Kupier belt and Sedna uh, uh, into this frame, and then you put that inside here, you can see how far the Oort cloud goes out. And it's, it's actually fairly close, uh, it's not that far, the nearest star is a little over four light years away. So it's extending quite a bit. So there's evidence that this is, this is the place where the long period uh, comets exist, that this is where their orbit extends to, like the Halley Comet. And there's an estimate that there's a lot of mass out here. It's spread out uh, in a very large area and about <clears throat> three, um, times 10 to the 25th kilograms of mass, but and again about 25% water. So when you add do this all together, you get 1.5 followed by uh, 15 zeros <clears throat> cubic kilometers, which turns out to be about <clears throat> 10,000 times the more uh, of the water that exists on Earth. So this is an estimate, of course, um, but it's uh, uh, there's undoubtedly a lot of water out there. Okay, so this um, shows a summary that I showed early on of the water in the solar system, only looking at the major bodies, so not ex excluding um, excluding the uh, potential water in the Kupier belt and the Oort cloud. So here we have um, Ganymede with the most, Triton next, Callisto, which I didn't talk about, Europa, Triton, Pluto, then Earth at one, Iapetus, uh, Ceres, and Enceladus. Um, here, and then 
way down um, is uh, Mars, which has the most water other than Earth in the inner solar system and vanishingly amount, small amounts of water. And then looking at the densities again, um, you can see Earth stands out having um, a measurable amount of water on the scale I just showed, but having a much higher density than all of the other objects that have wa uh, lots of water in them. And this is uh, um, the global equivalent water levels on these objects, uh, these uh, bodies in, in kilometers. Um, and uh, you can see <clears throat> where they, wh what the size, the amounts are. Somewhat maybe more instructive than this graph is this one. So this shows the global equivalent layers in planet radii. So this is 0.22 of the radius of Iapetus. It would be this global equivalent layer. So you can see that these, even though there's not a lot of water on like Enceladus, it is a, a significant, the size of its uh, surface ocean is quite large compared to its radius, 17% of its radius. And you can see Earth, um, Earth is down here at a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of its radius, because very, uh, just a tiny fraction of the uh, uh, volume of Earth is, is its water, and even less so for Mars. Okay, so uh, now we're um, going to get into the uh, uh, summary part, well, the question of where the water is. I showed you where it was early in the solar system, uh, vapor in the inner uh, solar system, uh, be inside the snow line, uh, ice crystal, ice blocks in, uh, uh, in, in mixed up uh, with uh, chondrite of uh, these asteroids, uh, water bearing asteroids, car car carbonaceous chondrites. Um, and the planets um, uh, in the inner solar system were formed by accretion of, uh, of, of, of these water bearing uh, chondrite, uh, carbonaceous chondrite asteroids. Um, and formed at very high temperatures. The planets beyond the snow line were formed by uh, conglomeration accretion of gas uh, and water. And, and um, uh, so the planets were largely accretion of gas, but mostly hydrogen gas and, and helium, but mostly hydrogen. The moons were formed uh, largely from water ice and siliceous material, which have a very low density. I should mention that the planets um, um, uh, the planets uh, are um, uh, are also quite low density because they're made out. Of, uh, they're huge and they're massive, but they're made out of uh, hydrogen. So I think uh, Jupiter's uh, density is below two grams per cubic centimeter, but it's huge. Okay, so where did Earth's water come from? Well, there's two theories. One is one is that the water <clears throat> uh, Earth may have held on to some of the water when it formed, and we'll talk about that in a bit. This water may have been recycled through the planet's mantle uh, to form the water we see on the surface. The second theory, which had been is uh, up until recently probably the most popular theory, is that uh, the inner planets gain what water they had um, through uh, asteroid collision because it was felt that they would be so warm and so hot during their formation, and they would be they would be liquid metal. I mean, they would be liquid rock you know, uh, oceans of uh, of liquid rock initially. And so water would never have been able to uh, exist on these. And, <clears throat> and in fact, in Earth's case, even more water that might have been existed might have been vaporized when the collision that formed the moon happened, when a Mars-sized object hit the moon, uh, and hit the planet, and then the debris formed the moon. So <clears throat> the, uh, this, this uh, second theory, suggests that very little water was uh, existed because of, from the formation, but then ice-rich asteroids, carbonaceous chondrites, um, populated the water, which had the right um, um, DH ratio because um, the uh, DH ratio of these uh, carbonaceous chondrites was uh, very close to what the surf water uh, ratio is right now on Earth. And so it and comets, uh, on the other hand, um, had a DH ratio that's much higher, even higher. So it, it's thought that in, in this context, the water probably came from uh, uh, these carbonaceous chondrites. So this supports the asteroid theory, but 
you know, there's a question is whether uh, that would have uh, assumed that the ratio of um, <clears throat> the, the isotope ratio would have stayed the same all during the time that the planet formed. And there's some uh, evidence that that may not be the case. And so it's actually some fairly good evidence. So, and, and uh, the ratio presumably changed because in the, uh, if, if the ratio was lower um, early on, the, the, during, the form, during the time between uh, its formation and now, the lighter hydrogen would have been more preferable, uh, would have been lost to space. And so you would expect over time that the uh, deuterium ratio would increase uh, because of the loss of the lighter hydrogen versus the heavier hydrogen. Then in, in more recent years, this, uh, a newer, newer models have been uh, suggested that, uh, that Earth may have retained a lot more of its hydrogen uh, as it formed. And motion, oceans, oceans may have formed uh, much uh, earlier than people had previously thought. And uh, in fact, there may still be a fair amount of water locked up into the uh, mantle and the core of the uh, planet. So this uh, next uh, uh, graph is uh, just shows in steps uh, the, the process that uh, might have happened. The first part of it is pretty non-controversial. It's uh, pretty clear uh, uh, that these terrestrial planets formed from planetary embryos with, uh, which would have had a fair amount of water on them. Uh, essentially, these are uh, carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, and they would have uh, existed and gradually uh, bump, bumped into each other. And during, uh, during the uh, time from their initial formation, they probably would have differentiated. It turns out that the deuterium, um, uh, in deuteri the higher density deuterium exists where the temperatures are higher and the lower uh, density, lower density exists in the cooler areas. So the inner areas of these chondrites probably have the, lo uh, the uh, lower uh, density of deuterium and the outer layers have the higher density. Then it's also presumed that when these uh, carbonaceous chondrites floating around in the inner solar system uh, with probably uh, magma ocean on the surface, they accumulated some of the hydrogen uh, that was in this uh, vapor cloud of, uh, of this water vapor cloud that existed in the uh, inner area. And this inner area being at higher temperature, um, the analysis suggests, well, because of the higher temperature, the deuterium ratio was, was going to be much lower. So very low deuterium ratio hydrogen entered this magma ocean. And then it gradually uh, uh, formed uh, at the boundary, the, the core mantle boundary, uh, where um, layers of the innermost would be the least deuterium, a little more in this boundary, and less so uh, as you got, went out towards the surface. Then these bodies would accumulate and bump into each other and, and uh, eventually coalesce into our planet. And the, this, uh, the, this particular model, and this is all, there's a fairly, there's a very 40-page paper that goes into a lot of the chemistry involved with how all of this happened. But the, the bottom line is that Earth may very well have a core with a, 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 a low deuterium hydrogen ratio, about 4.8 oceans of water. All right, and uh, 2.0 oceans in the mantle and our current one ocean berth uh, uh, that we have on the surface. So, uh, so if water, so this, this model suggests that, um, and I'll have more to say about this in a second, but if this model was correct and that Earth's oceans formed from water that uh, accumulated on our planet during its formation would have solved a couple of problems that uh, planetary scientists have. One is why Earth has so much water in the first place. And the second is, um, and particularly considering the fact that we have a very high density, uh, the density of the planet is very high, yet uh, there's considerable water. And on top of that, how water might have gotten here so early, because we know there's evidence that, um, that there's signs of their life that goes back within hundreds of millions of years of the formation of the planet. So for that to have happened, there must have been some water here at that time. And 
could the asteroids have accumulated enough water to have supported this amount of early life? So this this idea that Earth may have had uh, may have sourced its own water in early on uh, has that attractive feature that it explains how water might have happened early. So um, so the question is, all right, well, what's the evidence for this? Well. Um, one uh, one thing you can look for is the um, and by the way the, the there's a lot of detail about how this low deuterium ratio um, uh, hyd uh, got uh, was captured in in this liquid um, magma and it has to do with uh, uh, interaction between hydrogen and iron droplets and that's all explained in this paper which I'm not going to go into but the question is what about the hydrogen ratio the deuterium hydrogen ratio in early rocks. And so uh, to test this theory, there has, there's a, a recent paper that uh, shows results of analysis of rocks that are in the uh, Canadian uh, maritime, in fact, uh, up in the Baffin Islands specifically. And it shows this is, uh, this is relative to the surface. So this is the deuterium ratio essentially at the surface of the earth. And um, it shows that these rocks, um, um, which were, uh, 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 dated um, uh, at, as, uh, as quite old um, and containing various amounts of water in them had a much lower deuterium ratio than the, than the rocks that exist on the surface. So these older rocks, which, and if you, I gave this talk on um, uh, last fall about uh, some of the, uh, the fact that Canadian Maritimes, particularly uh, a Labrador as some of the oldest rocks on the world, uh, Earth, some as many as four billion years old. Well, anyway, when they analyzed this, they found, yes, indeed, there was, the deuterium ratios in those rocks are substantially lower, 20% lower uh, than the surface. So that does give support to the fact that early on, the deuterium ratio on Earth was lower than it is now. So one of the key questions, though, is how did all of this, how did this, um, this rock uh, or how this water that is buried in the core in the mantle get to the surface and populate our oceans. So uh, there's also been recent studies on this and in particular a professor at uh, Ohio State University has developed a theory and um, in making uh, an observation that uh, earth in, uh, in the solar system is unique because it has liquid water on the surface but it's also unique because it's the only object only a uh, planet that has active plate tectonics. And the, the core of the model that is being presented here is that the, man, the water in the mantle may have been the key to the plate tectonics and plate tectonics may be the mechanism that brought the water to the surface. So basically what you have, we, we usually think of a water cycle involving the surface and the atmosphere, but there, there is a proposed a similar water cycle that goes from the surface down into the core in the mantle and then back up to the surface. And so experiments are underway to support this theory and may involve uh, a process involving uh, garnet being uh, a water carrier. Um, so that's, um, so now we get to the summary of the talk. Um, Simplistically, uh, as I explained early on, the sun was formed from a cloud of gas. In fact, all stars are formed from uh, these clouds of nebular gas. Um, leftover material is how the planets and the moons formed. Compositional differences between the inner and the outer solar system is basically because of the prevalent temperature difference. Inner solar system, very hot, only refractories formed. Uh, and whereas in the outer solar system, you had uh, the, the moons, uh, forming from uh, water, ice, and silicate material, moon, this, the big planets from gas, largely hydrogen. Um, to us in, on Earth, it's surprising that uh, only 0.01% uh, of the water is uh, uh, present on Earth, whereas the vast majority of the water exists beyond the snow line. And even when you ignore the Coupier and Oort belts, water still ha has only 1% of the water in the solar system main bodies. But on the other hand, you could argue, well, it's surprising that there's that much water on Earth, since Earth was made from refractory materials at very high temperatures. Uh, but um, 
in addition, uh, but adding to this uh, uh, quandary, uh, uh, this question, as I mentioned uh, shortly ago, life requires water and, and life began very early, indicating that water had to be present. So um, this whole question about uh, water and where it came from on Earth or the, and in, uh, the inner planets, but it's mostly on Earth, um, is very much an ongoing topic. And so this is uh, not a done deal one way or the other. But um, the, the models, uh, these new models are suggesting that Earth's water um, uh, existed, came from these, um, uh, what was present and was brought to the surface. Um, but it's likely that the answer is some combination of the two, so that early, some of the water, that particularly water early on in Earth's history, may very well have come from the uh, Earth itself, that water that hydrogen that was existing on the planet uh, when it was formed, but undoubtedly it's been in, uh, it's, it has had collisions with the uh, asteroids. And so that there's probably addition to the water brought to it by these uh, carbonaceous chondrite asteroids. Plate tectonics may very well be the mechanism that uh, by which is bound and buried water has reached the surface, uh, giving a whole new meaning to the, the water cycle. And, uh, and, and frankly, uh, this actually may provide another Goldilocks factor for life on Earth. So not only is the plate tectonics important uh, for uh, several reasons, it may also be the key to unlocking of water early on in, on our planet. Um, I mentioned uh, in the publicity to the talk, we, talk, we were going to talk about water and other extra solar systems, uh, extra solar systems beyond uh, ours. But frankly, um, the, the bottom line is it's very likely that there is a lot of water in, in other solar systems as well, because hydrogen comprises 90% of the elements in the universe. And if there's oxygen around, um, it's, uh, it's easy to oxidize uh, hydrogen to form water. Hydrogen is very reactive. Um, okay, so that is the end of the talk. Um, I am going to um, stop the uh, sharing of this and uh, answer a few questions that have uh, come uh, to uh, us during the talk. And um, so I might, uh, let me quickly go through them. Uh, one question, uh, which was, uh, what, what about the uh, O2? So you, you talked about hi uh, hydrogen existing. Where did the oxygen come from that oxidized the hydrogen that was uh, locked up in the, uh, in the core of the planet? And the answer is that, our sun is the third, uh, is probably a third generation star. And uh, in which, what, what does that mean? All, everything in the solar, everything in the universe, other than hydrogen and helium, and a little bit of, um, uh, of lithium, what came from stars. We're all stardust. And the largest stars uh, form, uh, our sun will produce, uh, will create helium out of the hydrogen and then helium will, will also go through a nuclear reaction that will create carbon, but then the, it ends. The larger stars create elements all the way out, in fact, all the way out through uranium. They create all, everything else, including oxygen. So that's why we, we, a first generation star would have only been made out of hydrogen and helium, whereas, so the oxygen came from uh, several generations of stars that existed and then, uh, <clears throat> Uh, exploded in supernova, and and so the the cloud that the sun and our solar system formed had oxygen in it right from the get go. Um, another question uh, was, um, what about water on the planets themselves, the large planets like Jupiter and uh, and Saturn and, and Neptune and Uranus? And the answer is there is water there, but not very much. And I tried to find uh, numbers for the water on these uh, large planets. And uh, I couldn't. Uh, there's no, and the water that exists is going to be in its atmosphere, which is probably the atmosphere is a very small amount of mass compared to the total planet. And so the chances are there isn't a lot of water there, but there has, there is some, ev very evident in the uh, in the Jupiter atmosphere that there's water vapor. But um, uh, I don't have numbers for that. That will only make if if there is significant water there, that just makes the ratio between Earth's water and water elsewhere um, that much smaller. For, uh, but 
So uh, anyway, uh, those were the, um, well, yeah, one question also was, excuse me, uh, where did our um, uh, Mars uh, uh, magnetic field uh, disappear? How did it disappear? Well, it was probably formed by the uh, iron core in the uh, planet, uh, just like it does in the Earth. There's a, the core is moving, and uh, ions, uh, when they move, create a magnetic field. But on Mars, that um, being that much further from the sun, probably in the first uh, 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 half a million, uh, a billion to uh, a billion uh, years, uh, froze. And once the uh, once the iron freezes into a and become solid, that motion stops, and so does the magnetic field. And so that was kind of the demise of, uh, of a lot of uh, things on, on Mars. Its atmosphere, its water, uh, all went once, uh, and plus the fact that it's, it has less density, it has less gravity, significantly less gravity than Earth. And so its ability to hold on to uh, the atmosphere just by that factor alone is also uh, uh, less, much less than on Earth. So that uh, I think were those are the main questions uh, that uh, um, that I received uh, while I was talking. Thank you very much. I enjoyed giving the talk, and I hope you enjoyed uh, hearing it.